Welcome to my talk about uh, cryptocurrency and security. Uh, my name is Michael Perklin. I've been involved with the Bitcoin scene for about four years, maybe four and a half years now. Uh, I'm the president of Bitcoin Sultans. We are a Bitcoin security firm. We do... Thank you. Uh, we do Bitcoin security audits. So we take uh, classical information security knowledge, which I'm sure many of you, if not all of you have, and we take Bitcoin experience and we sort of merge the two when we, uh, when we do security audits of Bitcoin exchanges and Bitcoin gambling sites and other Bitcoin companies. I'm also director of the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. We are a nonprofit organization that tries to educate Canadians about Bitcoin. Uh, I've, I've had the, the pleasure to speak to our, our Senate about Bitcoin to help explain cryptocurrencies to them so that they, as they craft the new laws which will allow cryptocurrencies in Canada, um, they are doing that in a well-informed way. And I'm the president of C4, which I'll talk to you in a, about in a second. It's been a second. So Cryptocurrency <laughs> Certification Consortium is C4. And just, um, can you guys hear me back there? I know there's a lot of noise back there. I don't know if any of you can hear me. You can, that's excellent. So uh, I'll, I'll get into what C4 is about uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but for today's 20 minutes, I'm going to rant a little bit about the state of security in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, that rant will eventually become relevant. You'll, you, it'll sort of evolve. And then I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about C4. So the cryptocurrency landscape, the way the cryptocurrencies work right now is that Everything old is new again. People are sort of bringing back the bell bottoms. They're bringing back the plaid and the thick rim glasses. It's, it's sort of hipster all over again. Uh, we have companies out there that are building invoicing systems with Bitcoin. Well, invoicing systems have existed for a long time. We have other companies that are building currency exchange systems with Bitcoin. Well, again, currency exchange systems have, been, have existed for a long time. Uh, there are even some companies that are doing uh, certifications in the cryptocurrency space, but I digress. Everything old is new again. And when you start reinventing uh, things that have been uh, existing for a while, you, you can run into some problems. Uh, and I'm sure you guys know what happens when you start to reinvent the uh, cryptographic algorithms. You know, if you try to make your own hash algorithm, if you try to make your own cri uh, cryptography algorithms, Obviously, it's not going to work out that well because you're not a math whiz. You're not a, you don't necessarily know how to do all these things, but that doesn't stop people when it comes to the cryptocurrency space. People are rebuilding the things that they use every day. And that has led to a lot of problems. How many have heard of the empty Gox bankruptcy that happened in, in February this year? I imagine pretty much everybody has their hands uh, up in the air. So. When Empty Gox went insolvent and they announced to the world that, sorry, we don't have the money that everybody is, has given us to hold for them in, in safekeeping, a lot of people heralded that as the end of Bitcoin. The Bitcoin protocol is now useless because one company went bankrupt. And of course, that isn't exactly accurate because Bitcoin is just a protocol. It, instead of, you know, let's say you're sending an email, that's a letter over IP. The SMTP protocol allows you to send letters over the internet. Well, Bitcoin allows you to send money over the internet. It's just a protocol. And because it's a protocol, just because one company that dealt with that protocol went under doesn't necessarily mean that the whole protocol is dead. Uh, what's the most recognizable name in email right now? Gmail? G Google? That's right. Well, what would happen if Gmail went bankrupt? Would email suddenly become useless? Is, does that make any sense? Absolutely not. Email is still useful. I mean, if I, I need to send a letter over, over IP, I'm going to do it regardless of whether Gmail exists or not. And that's the exact same thing that happened with empty Gox. They just had really, really crappy security. Now, on the, on the surface, on the front, they, they had so many security features. They had uh, requirements for passwords. You need to have so many characters. You need to have so many different character sets. They even had these two-factor authentication tokens. You could either use Google Authenticator or one of these fancy YubiKeys. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a YubiKey before. They're, they're awesome. Uh, these little devices are amazing. It's just a second factor. So on the front door, they had all this amazing security with all these different things. They had Cloudflare to, to block um, uh, their server IPs from being found by, by people who are trying to hack them. All this amazing security on the front, but that didn't stop anybody from get, walking around it all and taking all of their money. 
it doesn't matter how secure your front door is when people are just gonna walk around it and, and take everything. As we all know, as security researchers, security is as strong as, as the weakest link in the chain. You, every single link in the chain needs to be secure together for the whole chain to be secure. Because if you have one weak link, link in the chain, it really doesn't matter. Now, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, when it comes to any cryptography for that matter, there's really only one way to keep things secure, and that's to protect the key. There's a concept in cryptocurrencies called cold storage, and that is when you have, uh, where's this thing? So these are all the uh, servers right here that are running a, a system. They're online, they're connected. You can see all these lines. Look at all those lines. It's totally connected. That's online on the internet. But then you have this other machine over here that has no network, no Wi-Fi. It is absolutely disconnected. With such a system, you cannot hack it remotely. There's no way that a Trojan can somehow land on that system because it is not talking to a network. This is how Empty Gox was set up. They had maybe 95% of all of their users' funds, all the millions of dollars that everyone from around the world who has given Empty Gox their money, they secured 95% of it in an offline system that was not connected to the internet. Only 5% was actually online and accessible by all their company systems so that th they could process withdrawals. This is how it is, uh, this is how most normal people do security. But then MT Gox got hacked. They lost millions of dollars of all of their customers' funds. And when they had a press release the next day to explain what had happened, they said, the cold storage has been wiped out due to a leak in the hot wallet. Let that sink in for a second. The cold storage has been wiped out due to a leak in the hot wallet. What does that even mean? You've got your, your online systems connected to the internet where you have maybe only 5% of your users' funds connected. A leak there somehow depleted funds here how? What the hell were they doing that, that led to this? This doesn't make any sense. When it comes to any kind of cryptography, you need to make sure that all your keys are created securely, they need to be stored securely, they have to be used securely. Hell, when you're, when you're making an account, don't just use one key, why don't you use three keys or five keys or seven keys and then all the keys need to work together in order to do this. You, when it comes to cryptography, you really only have one job. You have to keep your keys safe. It, it, any kind of cryptography is useless when someone else finds out what your key is. You really only have one thing to do. Keep your keys safe. It's the most basic thing to do. Why weren't they following standards? Every industry has some kind of a standard, whether you're the payment card industry and you're dealing with credit cards, or you're dealing with the food safety and the, the, you're HACCP certified, or, or, or if you're having really anything. There's, there's industry standards that govern absolutely everything. And why weren't these guys following standards? It, like, it, it doesn't make any sense. What the hell were they doing? Then I realized, oh yeah, there, there are no standards in cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are so new. that Everything is so new in the cryptocurrency world that everything old is new again. So I looked at this and I said, why can't I solve that? And why can't my partner solve that? Why can't we form a group to solve that? And that's exactly what we did we created the cryptocurrency security standard. It's, well, it's CCSS for short. Um, our designer's still making our logo, so please excuse the fact that it has our, our, a, a generic logo, but we took this, this the, the, the standard things that everybody should be doing with the crypto system, and we basically turned that into a standard. There's really only three things you need to worry about. Creating keys securely, storing them securely after they're created, and then using them securely once you have them. Uh, and when you're creating a, an account that's gonna hold all of your funds, make sure that you string together multiple keys in an M of N setup. And maybe three of five people need to agree that funds have to be spent, or five of seven, or seven of nine if you like the Borg, or whatever. Um, so for these three things, we broke it down even more. Secure creation, what does that mean? Well, when you create a key securely, it should be created on an air gap machine. This prevents unauthorized access from malware and viruses, remote access trojans, and all those other things that can get at your computer when it's plugged into a network. You need to make sure that the key is created by the key holder themselves. 
This prevents co uh, copies from being created by authorized personnel. I mean, if I work with you, and we're in the same organization, and I'm going to create everybody's keys, and here, I'll give you this key, and I'll give you that key, and I'll give you that key, where's the security risk? Right here. Each person needs to create their own key and make sure that they're the only person who has ever seen that key and they're the only person who has access to that key. And finally, create it using a secure PRNG or a secure TRNG, a, a pseudo random number generator or a true random number generator. This prevents keys from being created in a deterministic way that can allow somebody else to create a duplicate key from what you have. Now, a quick sidebar. This actually happened in the Bitcoin world a few times. So, um, so people made an Android wallet. It's just a, a, a piece of software you can download from the Google Play Store, in, installed on your Android device, and it allows you to create Bitcoin keys so you, so you, can, in, uh, so you can send and receive Bitcoin. The problem was, whenever this uh, software was creating a brand new wallet, it was using the Android's random number generator. So dev random or dev u random from the Android device. What they didn't realize, and what nobody realized at the time, was that Android itself had a vulnerability. That every single Android device, when you first turn it on, uses the exact same seed to start the random number generator. This means that millions of people around the world all launched their Bitcoin program at the same time, hit create key at the same time, a brand new key was created that equaled every single person all around the world. Everybody created the exact same key. People started loading their wallets with funds. Other people were looking at their phone and saying, wow, somehow I just got 10 Bitcoin on my wallet. I didn't even send that, but I'm going to quickly send that away so that I have control of that. And people's funds were being stolen all around the world, all because they were not created with a secure random number generator. Yeah, uh, I heard you say that sucks. That really does suck, especially when Bitcoin was you know, $1,200 a pop. So, so that's secure creation. Secure storage. Once you've created this key, you need to store it securely. You have to store it in a lockable container. That will prevent unauthorized access. When it is in that lockable container, you should store it encrypted. That helps so that even if somebody does get access to that lockable container and they do get that key, it's useless to them because they don't know the password to decrypt it. Uh, and of course, the encryption key for that don't put it on a post-it note on a thing. Keep that stored in some other place. Uh, and finally, have key backups for recovery. But the key back backups that you keep should be at least as secure, if not more secure, than the primary one that you're using every day. Um, <coughs> and that's just secure stores. The, the third piece was secure use. Of course, the key should only ever be used by the key holder only. There should be no circumstances when somebody gives their key to somebody else to use. Um, when the key is used to sign, when it's used to generate a digital signature, the random number that's being used inside that digital signature also needs to come from a cryptographically secure random number generator. And this is yet another attack that has happened in the uh, cryptocurrency space. People have scanned all through the blockchain, looking at every single transaction that has ever been sent by anyone around the world, and they've identified weak signatures. A weak signature is a signature that has a random number that is deterministic, a random number that you know. Because if you take the private key and a completely random number, those with math get scrambled to make a signature that nobody can undo. But if you have a signature that has a random number that you do know and a private number that you don't, it's just simple math to figure out what that private key was along with that random number that you know. To, uh, so uh, people found private keys and stole a lot of money because of poor signatures or dirty signatures. Um, and finally, only use them offline where possible. And as you're, as you're signing them, if you're using your key and you're signing one of these signatures, you should think about it and say, do I actually need to send this? This prevents a leak in the hot wallet depleting the cold wallet, which is what happened in empty Gox. So in summary, the CCSS, the cryptocurrency security standard that we've uh, drafted, it's about 30 pages so far. And that's mostly because, like any standard that you've ever read, it, you, we have to go through all the minutia of defining every single little term, every single little concept in excruciating detail. But this is what we have to do. 
And this draft has already been peer-reviewed by chief information security officers and chief, uh, chief executive officers at various Bitcoin companies by security professionals, and we're hoping to release this in one or two weeks. And one last thing before I, I let you guys go, um, I mentioned C4. So C4, we actually do two things. Standards is one of them, because we're looking at this saying that somebody needs to make a standard, and go, well, why can't that be us? The other one is personnel certification, and this is because my other company, Bitcoin Sultans, where we do Bitcoin security, we were trying to hire Bitcoin professionals, Bitcoin security professionals, people who had your knowledge as security professionals and people who had Bitcoin knowledge from the Bitcoin world. And we found we can only really find people with Bitcoin or with security, but we couldn't find that overlap. So we, we w and, and people w would be interviewing them and they'd say, yeah, I know Bitcoin. It's that anonymous, untraceable currency, isn't it? And we're like, no, Bitcoin is not anonymous. And it definitely isn't untraceable. Have you ever tried clicking through the blockchain? You can trace every single payment. That's how we detect counterfeit. That's how Bitcoin works. So we said, well, we need a way to differentiate between somebody who actually knows Bitcoin and somebody who doesn't. So we created this, the, Bitcoin, the Certified Bitcoin Professional, or a CBP. It's just like um, the CISSP or the CISA. Uh, it's someone who knows how to use Bitcoin. This is for accountants or lawyers or sales professionals um, and anyone who needs to prove that they know and understand Bitcoin. Uh, and one more, the certified Bitcoin expert. This is for developers who code with it every day. Programmers, software engineers, security auditors, security consultants, people who actually need to know how it works on the wire level. So why do I love Bitcoin? Because everything old is new again. Uh, all the old attacks, all the old things need to be recreated for this new economy and they're doing it all in a decentralized way and I love it. So if you have any questions, come find me. Thank you.